Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us this evening for the next instalment of our Architecture Alumni Talks for 2021. Um, my name is Professor Cameron Brune. I'm the Dean and Head of School here at the University of Queensland School of Architecture. Before we get the start of this evening, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which many of us are meeting today. I pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. And together we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So I'd now like to introduce our presenter for this evening, Claire Humphreys. Hi, Claire. A little about, about, about Claire. Claire is an associate and design leader at Kirsten Thompson Architects in Melbourne. Since starting there in 2013, she's worked on a broad range of project types, scales and stages, both at K KTA and previously. In her role as a design leader, she proactively encourages, directs and supports project teams with design management, explorations and resolution of design intents from early inception to construction. Claire is an alumni, of course, of the University of Queensland. She graduated in 2009 and she received the Queensland Institute of Architects Memorial Medallion, the Peter Hale Cox Rayner UQ Prize for Architecture and the Carl and Gertrude Langer Design Prize. In 2011, she was awarded the A.E. Brooks Travelling Scholarship to visit Maggie Centres and Women's Centres in the UK. Ladies and gentlemen, it's my great pleasure to introduce you to Claire Humphreys. Good evening, Claire. Thanks, Cameron. Um, I'll just share my screen. Great. Go. Um, so I would like to acknowledge and pay my respect to the traditional owners of the lands upon which I am located the Wurundjeri, Woiwurrung and Bunurong, Boonwurrung peoples of the East Kulin Nation. Uh, this freezing Melbourne winter day on 200 and something of lockdown has made me really crave some humid Brisbane heat and a huge hill to walk up. Uh, and pulling out my old uni files has definitely amplified this nostalgia. So hopefully my talk hasn't become too skewed by all of that. Uh, but it has been very enjoyable to consider what ideas still stand out years later. Whoops, sorry, technical fail already. There we go. Um, sorry, everyone, I don't know what's happening. There we go. Nope. There we go, sorry about that. Uh, so with nostalgia in my heart, I am one of the first articles we were ever given to read at uni, uh, David Maloof's A First Place, The Mapping of a World. At KTA, we have a monthly reading group and we're actually going to read it this month. And it still stands up as a really beautiful piece of writing on architecture with some great phrases like, um, there's no clear map for the mind to move in it's where cats have their kittens and sick dogs go, or the description of how a house and a topography can habituate you to not listen and to not see. I think I'm also drawn to it because it is so connected to human emotion and experience as a piece of writing. And uh, when I first started uni, my other main choice of study was physics and mathematics. And in the event, end, I abandoned them because they just um, don't involve thinking about other people. Uh, one of my favourite subjects at uni was Housing People in Place, which was run by Greg Bamford. And I still have the reading on my bookshelf, which I've scanned here as proof. Um, this subject led to the sorts of books pictured here, which at their core are introductions to empathy and deep listening in architecture. That to be a good architect, you need to acknowledge that there are many different ways of experiencing the world and that your own experience of the world can't be the only information that you draw on when designing. And this also involves trying to understand your own privileges that you might take for granted, that allow you to move through space more easily than others. I was very excited as well to discover 
one of the authors of Housing as if People Mattered when Dee Sarkissian lived in Brisbane. Uh, so I went and worked for her as a student for a few years. Um, she had a practice as a community engagement planner and she became a really supportive mentor. At KTA now, um, I would say that the way we design within this context is a mixture of past experience, new research, listening and meaningful inventiveness. And the design goes through cycles of reflective processes that include listening to how different stakeholders respond to what we've come up with. And the level of intensity and formality of this process varies a lot with the project. Uh, I've included this diagram of a Walpiri birthing camp because it has stayed with me since I read about it at uni. It was probably the first time I'd read about First Nations understanding of the land and ways of dwelling. And I won't pretend to know all of the complexity that this diagram represents, um, and I don't have the authority to speak about it. But for example, there are windbreaks there that are perfectly positioned to protect people's heads while they're sleeping. I was also really taken with all of the spatial layering. Uh, it starts with the baby that is being birthed, um, protected by the mother, who in turn is supported by birthing assistants. Then there are other layers, um, some of which are spatial, so the distance between people and the ability to see people approaching. Others are human and use the understood social structure to provide further layers of protection. I do think it's an early point at which I understood in a more meaningful way that complex divisions of space aren't just about buildings. Um, landscape architects probably figure out that before many architects do. Uh, I pulled this diagram out again for my final year master's project and turned it into one of these postcards we were asked to do, which is what this slide is. Um, my project was for a women's centre and an urban precinct to support that centre in that order. And this, so this idea of focusing on the individual surrounded by all these protective and supportive layers became an important theme in my project. Uh, I've included this project of KTAs um, from well before I started working there. Um, I remember a friend showing it to me back at uni and it's such a good floor plan. Um, we talk about, <laughs> sorry, we talk at KTA about conceptual clarity and this plan sums that up. Going back to that Maloof article, um, Brisbane certainly forces you to deal with hills when you design buildings. And at UQ, we had an appreciation of the section drilled into us. Uh, and that's something I still really value, as well as working heavily with diagrams and three dimensionally. And on reflection, I think when you're learning, you need to be forced out of the plan all the time, just so you can train your brain to think spatially. But I am going to go a bit against that tradition in this talk and celebrate floor plans, as there were so many spatial relationships are worked out. They take longer than the sections and elevations to draw because they contain so much complexity and information about how the building is working. I had a few different courses. My longest workplace before KTA was at Kevin O'Brien Architects. Um, I was very green when I worked on these projects. Kevin managed to achieve so much with tight budgets and very remote sites. Uh, about when I was doing my master's, um, Kevin started a project called Sep Yama Finding Country, which he ultimately took to the Venice Biennale in 2012 and has also taught at universities. I was involved in coordinating the project when I worked there, and I also made a submission with my friend Robin. I'll read from the Finding Country website because I think it's a really nice statement. Um, the Aboriginal map of Australia reveals a continent with many countries and many spaces. The prevailing spectrum of architectural positions, bookended by decorated sheds and metaphysical decks, continues to bring Aboriginal country into decline. If the opposite position is considered, it is possible to find something lost. We were asked to consider what our small extract of Brisbane would look like if 50% of the population was gone. It's a counterintuitive exercise that really forces people to reassess many of the assumptions behind that they have behind urbanism and to engage with a First Nations perspective of country. 
Uh, as Cameron mentioned, um, after I graduated, I did that UQ AE Brooks Travelling Scholarship to visit women's centres and Maggie centres in the UK. And there was a marked distinction between the two types of programs. Uh, the women's centres had much less funding and were working with existing buildings. The Maggie's Cancer Caring Centres are mostly new buildings designed by well-known architects. Uh, I did present this trip back to the staff of a Brisbane Women's Support Service who I'd been discussing the idea of a larger women's centre with. For my final year project, a friend who worked there had given me input into my brief and then we um, shared the project back with the support service that she worked for. So that was a nice um, synergy. Uh, I've recently been involved in KTA um, for a child and family mental health centre. Um, it's yet to be built, so I can't share images yet. So I'm sharing an image of the Maggie Centre. Um, it's for children under 12 to stay with their families, and it's an alternative therapeutic approach to acute mental health facilities, but when other therapy options just aren't working. So it's a place for very vulnerable and stressed young people and their carers. And we really couldn't find any other places like it. And there are an amazing group of people who will run the centre who've developed the model of care and the brief. And we were able to be involved in the co-design process that they ran to gain insight from um, colleagues, their colleagues, the families they've worked with, First Nations stakeholders and more, lots of different people. Um, but we did also use the Maggie Centres as a strong precedent for this project. Uh, the Maggie's Brief is all about ways to deinstitutionalize a building and to make people feel welcome and safe. And Maggie's West London is a good example of some of the key principles. Uh, and it's one of the places I had arranged to visit. So uh, there's a central kitchen and a table where I did see people talking informally about their problems. And the spaces are then organized around this central heart so that people have control over how engaged they would like to be. For instance, you can self-select to sit at the table in the center, um, or you can sit in the library nearby and sort of position your chair how you'd like it to be. Um, or you can sit outside in the sunshine, but still see people back through the windows. And the spatial layout is supported by an approach to staffing. Um, there's no reception. So instead, when I first arrived, a staff member greeted me and explained things to me and showed me around. And there's no signage anywhere, um, but you end up not needing it. So, um, you know, this, by the time you finish the tour, the staff member has recontextualized the place as somewhere they want you to stay and use. And it really did fundamentally change my feeling of being in the building, uh, not just the architecture did that. So um, post-university, I've done a number of projects as a sole practitioner, uh, most of the time in collaboration with other people. Um, I wanted to share some of these first, and then I'll take you through some projects I've been working on at Kirsten Thompson Architects. So some people might know this one. It's um, the Jewel House, which is the first project I did. Um, so it's a house for my mother, and I started working on it right after I finished uni. Kevin and I came up with a mentorship slash association agreement, which was very generous of him. Um, it was a very steep learning curve for me, but it was also a great baptism by fire. Uh, so the site is in St. Lucia, a suburb I'm sure you're all familiar with. And um, there's a gully running through the base of the site and eight neighbours have clear views into the site. So the backyards of the properties are occupied by trees, although similar subdividing could change this outlook in the future. So it was important to address the trees, but not rely on them being there for the house to work. Uh, there's no unmediated views into the building, but the scale and punctures are designed to make it feel lived in. And the materiality is lifted from the typical suburban palette of the adjacent houses, so half are timber weatherboards and the other half a cement render. Here you can see the main trees on the site and the sloping terrain and then driveway access is to the base of the slope here. Um, each tree has its own vegetation protection covenants and there's a stormwater easement along the gully. Uh, there was also a flood level setting the garage level. So in the end, a civil engineer set the location of the garage walls. 
Uh, one of the first moves I made on the site was to cut into the hill on a 45 degree angle so that the walls trace the line of the hill and that you can occupy the hill. Um, and then a combination of these site parameters informs the resulting plan geometry. And the result is a spatial experience that's complex and varied, but has its own internal logic. And this is read in plan as the intersection of these formal geometries that have been both positioned and disrupted by the locations of the trees. The trunks are then orientation points as you move around the building. And rather than an open plan, the house consists of a series of more intimate spaces, partly to accommodate someone on their own, um, my mother, but it also functions well with multiple people. Like there's lots of different places to be that are still connected, but uh, you aren't on top of one another. Climatically throughout the day, um, this strategy also works as you can follow or hide from the sun. And because of the limited opportunities for views out of the site, um, I've set up opportunities for longer views within the building, often through another room to the garden. Uh, so I'll take you on a quick tour. Um, the entry is fairly discreet in between the mass walls of the, guard, uh, of the garage. So you enter and go up a set of stairs. When you get to the top of the stairs, the prospect is aligned with one of the main trees at one corner of the triangular courtyard. Uh, you come up the stairs into a semi-external circulation spine that connects different parts of the program. Uh, as you know, courtyard buildings and staircases are good tools for creating a narrative. Uh, they set up a sequence of spaces that unfold in a particular order and constantly shift the user's direction of movement towards a different prospect. Uh, this semi-external terrace connects a study, main bedroom and the living areas, so you're constantly moving outside to get around. And the screened veranda, as well as providing security, also works really well climatically. So you can leave doors open all day so the house is being constantly ventilated. Uh, these glazed walls are large sliding doors that open up the corner of the courtyard. Uh, this one as a shot of one of those framed tree trunks beyond the building. From the kitchen, you're then pushed into the hill as you move around this corner. I really had to include this photo because of my mother's very elderly dog hanging out under the lowest part of that overhang. Uh, she spent a lot of time there. Uh, the smallest scale of the internal spaces is augmented by the large scale garden connections. Um, so you get these really clear views right through the building that start to dissolve the internal spaces. Um, the house contains elements of the two houses that I grew up in with my family. Uh, so they're spaces that my mother has lived in as well. Um, so our first house was a Queenslander seen in the tectonic elements of the posts pushing up the lightweight upper part of the house. Uh, the stereotomic elements come from the second house I grew up in, which is actually on the same contour uh, further along the gully uh, and it makes cuts into the site to negotiate the hill as well. So I kind of liked the idea of my mother just sort of moving further along the hill. Maybe she'll move to the next spot along in the future. Um, the house has shutters to create privacy. Uh, they open a specific distance so you look at trees instead of the eight neighbours. Uh, another idea I was experimenting with was using these coloured shutters to augment meant the way that the landscapes read out of the windows. Um, I don't have a photo of it, but um, depending on the colour of the frame perimeter, you sort of see different hues in the landscape. And the colours also affect the way light enters the room. So I did a little study up the top there while it was under construction. And they're also based on the colours of flowers and the trunks of the trees that are there on the site. And then finally, you move upstairs into a bedroom wing. And this can be ignored by my mother when she's there by herself. But it's really well used by my extended family and her friends as well. And it can also operate with a few different future family configurations. So I'll end on the floor plan. Uh, she hasn't quite completed my planting, but she's working on it. Um, I've included this project um, because it's another Queenslander. 
it was in a bad state, as you can see in that middle photo. And it was a real pleasure to measure it up and help restore it so that it will last into the future. I mean, they're such um, beautiful houses to work with. Uh, very sadly, the client passed away just before the house restoration was finished, but he did get to see most of it fixed up. Uh, and he had really fallen in love with the house. You can see the courtyard there cleared of outhouses. Um, in the after shot to the right, and he got on great with the builders who put his statue in the middle there as a joke. Might still be there for all I know. Uh, Kevin sends me photos of it from time to time of the house if he passes it, like the one below right, up on the shining up on the hill there. Uh, so I had worked on a design for the back part of the house um, with the client, but that never went ahead, unfortunately. Uh, this is another house extension I did for some friends in Northcote. Um, so for the party, there's one larger square space uh, that's bounded by a perimeter um, frame structure and further indicated by a large beam that bisects, it, um, bisects the square at 45 degrees. So this defined an area that's larger and more strongly defined than the internal living area, which is more loosely enclosed by these large sliders. So it's essentially a larger room with a smaller room in it. Um, I still haven't photographed it properly, but you get the idea. And um, the vines are finally starting to grow in the shot on the right, which also features my friend's kids with undies on their heads. Uh, the grid structure is screening the neighbour to the north while still letting in good northern light. And the vines will eventually grow up to filter the western sun. So it's that classic problem of the backyard facing the wrong way. Uh, I've just included a few other houses, partly to show how many things you can work on that don't go ahead and you just get very used to that. Um, I'm also working on an apartment renovation at the moment with Sullivan Skinner for a project in Brisbane. So moving on, I realise I have a lot of square floor plans emerging as a theme here. Um, I'm going to show you a couple of exhibition designs that I worked on. So this exhibition was created, curated by Vivian Zahurl in 2010 and was the first institutional exhibition of work by six young radically queer and trans transgender artist activists. Uh, there was no budget. So Vivian gave me about 200 concrete blocks that she had from her last show, as well as one temporary wall and some theater lights to work with. Um, so I've just wanted to include that plan there to show all the blocks I counted. Um, so, but the frugality kind of suited the show, which was in part about a culture of creative improvisation. And the space itself was a ballet rehearsal room and was a bit too big and covered in mirrors. So the black curtains have been pulled across and instead the art is centralized into a spine through the center of the room. And then the dramatic theatre lighting blends out this extra space into blackness. Uh, so this is another exhibition design that I did uh, for Vivian Zahurl in 2016 and Kevin O'Brien collaborated with, that, with us on that one. So one of the first questions we asked ourselves when beginning the project was how to engage with the gallery as a built public institution when the context of the exhibition was so particular in terms of territories, ownership, government control and government funding. And our response was a negotiation with the building rather than an acceptance of it. The relationship between our intervention and the gallery is intended to be tenuous to the point of feeling a bit awkward at times. And so we kept signage off the walls and we avoided attaching work to the walls where possible and appropriate. And the works are given judicious space to breathe. This impermanence of the support apparatus contrasts with the primary intervention on the gallery walls, which is cuts into the plasterboard. And you can see a plan there with three different hands on it, including the large um, cuts through the gallery represented in orange. Kevin tells a story of the origin of these holes in relation to bullets. Uh, and this is a quote. Um, I lived in Dublin for three years and every day I used to walk along O'Connell Street past the Dublin post office. 
All the columns of this neoclassical building had bullet holes through them from the Easter Rising in Ireland of 1916. And there were no bullets in the columns, but the mark, the sign of what had happened was always prevalent. A century ago, the Irish managed to get the British out of 26 of its 32 counties. Within the context of this exhibition, I thought what could have happened if our people had got the British out of Australia? Uh, sandbags were chosen for seating because they can be lifted by one person and can be brought in and removed at very short notice. Um, they have a pleasant tactile quality. They contain soil and sand. They were also chosen because of their references to flood management, uh, military usage, erosion control, temporary structures. The polypropylene they're composed of is um, the material of those big bags that people all around the world use to carry their belongings with them. It's just an everyday utilitarian material. I've done a couple of other galleries. Um, one recently with Dirk from Speculative Architecture. And while they all have very low budgets, they're still dealing with curatorial questions of how to display art. So they're great exercises in how to make a space work in a complex way with limited resources. Uh, I started working at KTA a bit over eight years now, starting as a graduate. Uh, there were under 10 people when I started and now we're over 40 people. So I've been there for a significant trans transformation. Uh, when I first started, I was working mainly on these ESOP stores and also projects such as Tarawara Cellar Door. So that has this circular cut into the hillside to make an entry courtyard here. Uh, and then the cellar door itself is dug into the hill to connect into the back of this long existing barrel store. So it makes this um, long dramatic receding space. That's pretty spectacular. Uh, I also worked on some multi-res, um, Church on Napier, which was uh, near a heritage church. I had a period where I gained a lot of site experience as a project architect during construction. So one was for the Deakin Architecture and Building School in Geelong. Um, this project was a renovation of an existing set of cellular offices into a more open plan arrangement. So in the right-hand diagram, the approach was to remove all of the walls running north-south, but retain just the ones running east-west to open up the school, but have screening for acoustic and visual separation. And then this plan also utilizes layers of space to create privacy. So in the diagram on the left, there's a public exhibition space in blue there, then a transition space in orange of meeting areas, print room, reception that buffers the more private office areas, uh, which are there in pink. And in the move from cellular offices to open plan, it also uses the distances between people to create privacy. With architecture schools, flexible display is critical. So all the solid surfaces aligned with pinnable acoustic panels and the niches become places for crits and the construction detailing is expressing services and stud framing as an educational element apart from anything else. Uh, another project I was project architect on during construction was for this private women's club, uh, which is a garden room with a tree canopy as its garden. After Lyceum Clubish, I moved into a bit more of a design manager role in the office, um, starting with this Queen and Collins project. Uh, almost all of the projects that I've been working on for the last few years haven't been finished yet. So unfortunately, I can't take you through them in lots of detail, but I do have renders. Um, so this is one, uh, this one is the refurbishment of an existing 1990s high rise tower. Um, so we did the ground plane and the first few levels and BVN have refurbished the tower part. Uh, there are significant heritage buildings on the site, and so the grain of these helped inform the strategy uh, as a series of smaller scale blocks that bound external and semi-external gathering spaces, which are those elements in purple in the diagram. We've also introduced new connections through the site, and we've been using the ideas of a city within a city 
and laneway, not lobby, to describe the approach. Uh, the Jewish Holocaust Center, which is also under construction. Uh, there's the White Horse Performing Arts Center, which we've been completing in collaboration with BKK Architects. Uh, the Queenscliff Hub is a new community center for Queenscliff uh, that combines a museum, library and visitor information center. And this is within a historical streetscape and includes the historic building. Uh, the facade incorporates a 24 hour museum of playful peepholes and it references the Fresnel lenses of the nearby historic lighthouses. So, in F1, uh, it has been built. So, this is Sunnies that were completed a few years ago. Um, Big Roads builds these public rest stops in remote areas to encourage drivers to take breaks, and many of them are designed by architects. Uh, so as a starting point, we researched our complex relationship to public toilets, all the myriad cultural variations, um, safety, hygiene and gender considerations. Uh, the par T of the undulating curve with the T inserts positions doors directly onto the exterior for safety and provides options to choose which side to use, depending on a user's assessment of personal comfort. Uh, the curve and the stainless steel T dividers avoid corners that accumulate grime and can be hosed out. And the building couldn't rely on delicate finishes or in the detailing. Um, we couldn't control construction to this extent. So don't look too closely at some of those details that they didn't, they didn't build our drawings properly sometimes. Um, we put the basins inside the toilet cubicles, partly for people who use water for ablutions. And then during the day, the toilets are lit naturally. Uh, and at night, the curve becomes a lantern with no dark corners. Um, we're doing more and more all gender toilets, and we managed to convince Vic Roads to adopt that approach for this project. There are many reasons all gender loos are becoming common practice. Um, they're fundamentally more inclusive. I thought it'd be nice to go through some of those reasons. Um, so for parents of children and carers, um, they allow either gender to be accompanied without concern for gender segregation rules. And this extends to carers who may need to assist someone of a dif differing gender and also age group. Efficiency, um, all gender toilets can be more efficient for users. Available toilets can be used by either gender, reducing disproportionate lines between male and female toilets. Um, that's something we've just done on a performing arts centre where, you know, you have peak periods for toilet use. Freedom and inclusiveness. So they reduce the need of the user to identify with a specific gender in order to access the facilities. Individual privacy doesn't need to be compromised by the absence of gender segregation. Um, airline toilets are a good example of toilets that are commonly not segregated by gender. And in, for this particular project, um, privacy is achieved through individual toilet cubicles. Uh, they also provide individual cubicles can provide a clear line of sight into the toilet as well. And then safety. So all gender toilets can provide additional safety for all users as minorities are no longer isolated and put in a potentially vulnerable situation. All gender toilets help create safe environments by increasing the presence of others in the immediate area where people can be seen and heard. Um, yeah, so I'll end with a final shot of the toilets at night, um, lighting up the trees. Thanks so much. And I have to say yeah. that the sun is setting, so I'll just shut my blinds as well. <laughs> it's quite atmospheric, Claire. There we go. Sorry about that. Thanks, Claire. That was great. And just a reminder to everyone, if you have a question for Claire, if you could just type that into the chat box and I'll relay that to her. But I might get things started, Claire. I, um, recently had the opportunity when you were in Brisbane in between the lockdowns that you've experienced 
um, having been based in Melbourne of recent years, um, to visit the Jewel House with you. Um, and it's remarkable as a first work of architecture, a first built work of architecture. And I wonder, um, have you reflected on the, on the kind of bravery and lessons of that, of that first work in, in thinking about it and revisiting it recently? Um, yeah, I mean, I think over the years I've had, in some ways, had a better understanding of the things I was doing with it as well, because I think sometimes you sort of design with intuition and can take a while to unpack um, that. Uh, I also continue to see things I was exploring in that, in current work at KTA, like, and other projects, like you sort of there are threads you start, things you start exploring that you continue to explore. Mm. Um, I mean, I am a, you know, I have to, I go back there every Christmas, so I get to review any reimagine it and you know, all those things, but also get to enjoy my mother using it, which is mm. nice. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. Um, I was struck by one of the things you taught, mentioned in regards to the period of time you've worked at KTA, which is about the changing size of the practice. And, you know, we tend to talk about people working at large practice, small practice, medium practice, you know, huge practice. Um, but it seems to me in terms of that period you've been there, you've actually navigated the period from it being a relatively boutique practice, though influential to a, a much larger practice working on bigger projects. I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about that, that journey in terms of the the opportunities and the challenges of the of the business growing quite quickly in a way? Yeah, because when I first started, um, there was a slight sense, uh, not of anarchy, but um, looseness in that, you know, you could sort of be sitting at your computer and just ask someone, like you'd end up having like an impromptu design crit around someone's computer because the whole office would get involved, like someone would start talking about a design problem and everyone would join in and that was fine. Um, so all of those sorts of things happened much more incidentally. So what we've needed to do now is try to think of ways to continue that culture of design conversation uh, when there are a lot more people and I mean that's only been made even more difficult in a pandemic because now we're all remote so we can't even look over each other's shoulders anymore um, so you know we do things like weekly design crits monthly readings we've got design channels on teams um, but yeah it's definitely something we're still we still grapple with but I think we've also done a good job of retaining uh, the human aspects of the culture as well um, that, yeah, I feel like we have a no dickheads policy. So. A very good policy. Um, Claire, there's a question which I think is really inherent to the presentation you've given today, which was um, someone saying they're very interested to understand your view on collaboration, which you spoke about a lot today. Um, and the question is, why, does, why do you choose close collaboration as a strong element in your career? Or has it chosen you perhaps? Um, and how do you navigate the challenges of competing interests and the success in different success factors in, in collaborative projects? Yeah. Um, I mean, I think the short answer is if it works well, it leads to a better design outcome. Um, I think that when, because there's different ways I've done it. I mean, I did it on my mother's house um, because um, in part because I was so green that I didn't, you know, I needed, I kind of meant, like, I knew I needed a mentor, um, but it became a better design because, you know, we were sort of having that discussion. And I feel like having someone always who you can talk to, critique ideas with, um, only leads to a better design outcome. And that's the same at KTA. And anyone who works within a larger practice really has that experience of collaboration if it's working well that, um, yeah, you do just get to value the way to bounce. I, you get to value being able to bounce ideas off people. Um, and when I've worked just by myself, it's kind of the loneliest process, you know, or, I've, or I'll seek out friends and force them to give me an opinion, but mm. yeah. Because I guess the other element of collaboration that you've recently engaged with is being um, uh, two practices working together. 
So KTA mm. and BVN, uh, KTA and BKK. Um, how, have they have they been different in terms of the the nature of collaboration being at their at the level of the entity as opposed to the level of the individual? Um, yeah, there's I mean there's certainly complex things because you're working with people you haven't really worked with before. So um, you know if it, if it's the same people you work with every day, you get used to how each other works, and then it it does make you realise there can be real different studio cultures um, and you sort of don't notice that if you're in the um, in the culture until you step outside of it mm. um, but you know we've said say about that white horse one that yep. it's better than the sum of its parts that you know there's both practices in there and um, that's been a really friendly collaboration and yeah it's going on site so mm. um Claire, in your first slide, you showed the front, uh, a photocopied page from the front of the Maloof book. Yeah. And somehow that made me very sentimental because I don't know whose handwriting that is, but it was certainly handwriting that was familiar to me. <laughs> yeah, I know. In fact, until my recent move from Melbourne back to Brisbane, I think I probably still had that same photocopied article from the Armist Library, yeah. um, which, which, we all, which we all had. Um, and I wondered, thinking about the particularities of place that, that Maloof describes. Um, how, have you, how have you used that way of looking at place and understanding place to inform your work in another place, of working, you know, of going from working in the, in the landscape of the Queenslander and it, the way that's described and experienced to thinking about, for example, working on a terrace house, which is a very different type of um, experience, different type of um, site occupation, etc. Yeah, it's, I do, yeah, I mean, it's hard to say. Um, I mean, definitely the climate's very different. So all the sort of tools you develop around subtropical architecture are hard, you can't apply. So you need, it, you need to learn how people in Melbourne occupy space very differently to up in Brisbane. Um, they don't like being outside. They have a completely different attitude to shade. They don't like shade. <laughs> Whereas in Brisbane, you kind of can't get enough of it. Um, so that's where it differs. I do think that uh, there is, particularly in the pandemic, and more of an interest in almost natural ventilation down here. Like all of a sudden Melbourne discovered sitting outside and eating. Um, so I think just by the move, it, I think it makes you potentially more conscious of the climate in a way that I might not have been otherwise if I'd just grown up there and habituated myself um, to it. I, and I was serious about hills in Brisbane being a real thing. I think ha having to deal with terrain also helps you think, you know, because you're having to explore the, the potentials of that um, change in level constantly. Um, I think even when you're on a flat surface, you've done that thinking about what it can mean to move up and down more or, yeah, hmm. if that makes sense. Um, Claire, as you, as you know, we had Nick Flutter give a talk last week. Um, and I, I'd like to say by design and bringing pe two people together who'd been who'd studied together. Yeah, um, yeah. I'll, I'll report this to be a happy accident, which is delightful. Um, but I want to ask you a question about that sort of alumni experience. This is a, since this is, a, this is our alumni lecture series and it's our chance to, to touch base with um, our alumni working around the world in, in New York or in, or in Melbourne. Um, you've obviously stayed in, stayed in touch with a network, um, with people like Sullivan and Skinner, you know, through a collaboration. And I just wondered if you could reflect a little bit about how you've, how you've sustained that network of um, UQ alum, UQ architecture alum, despite the fact that you're obviously all incredibly diverse and dispersed in terms of your practices as yeah. architects. Well, I mean, it, it's true that being in the studio for the last couple of years really does, did make a difference to the sorts of friendships you can make, I think, um, that, you know, you can't, it's hard to make those sorts of connections remotely. And um, 
I do feel like the last couple of years, you know, like I said about collaboration, like the kinds of conversations you can have with your peers around your project work can be really valuable. And so, um, I mean, at the end of the day, it's about friendship and that, you know, we catch up and talk about architecture. Um, but that, yeah, when it is nice that when opportunities arise, we can also work together on different things. Like I've tried mm. to work with, yeah, different ones of them and they're all off starting great practices and things like that. So, yeah, mm. nice. Uh, this, is a, this is a question that you'll, you'll get asked again in your career, I'm sure. But what advice would you give someone studying architecture, either as an undergraduate or in the master's program now? in terms of thinking about their trajectory within our, within our profession? Well, I do think um, without pigeonholing people or anything like that, like that, you know, the kinds of things you're interested in now are potentially the kinds of things you're still going to be interested in in 10 years, and that's great. Like there's a diversity of things you can pursue. So, you know, you talk about my alumni. I think you've also had Paul Curry um, yes. as well, and... Nick, Paul and I all did kind of different things in final year and we've all done sort of different thing, pursued different things um, post uni. So I guess it's about figuring out what it is you're really mm. keen on. Um, I mean, I would say working hard at uni <laughs> makes a difference, um, but Good advice. you got the rest of your life as well, you know, because it's the time, it is a time to be free of budgets and clients and you know you've got plenty of time to learn all that stuff so in my opinion don't be too sensible but I do also think the number of times I practiced laying out toilets at UQ and working on actual real buildings was really valuable to me now it's about learning how to design great spaces that are also working spaces that aren't just sort of pie in the sky fantasies so, yeah. Good, adv good advice, Claire. Thank you. Um, interesting. I'm, I'll ask one last question, which is, I guess, around the nature of practice, of which has been also out the nature of education, of having um, been studios, architectural studios, and an architecture school that have both been very much location based, and that we, we, you know, the practice of coming together is part of. The production of buildings or of the of the training of training and research research in architecture have you as a practice group at kta started to think about what what aspects of our covid impacted world might drive change in your practice going forward um yeah it definitely forced us to up our technology in terms of um remote uh collaboration like remote discussions and things like that and i do think at the scale we're at some of the benefit of that has been being able to access the entire office all at once through sort of chats um online channels and things like that so someone can post a question about something and the whole office can answer as kind of a brains trust and that might not have happened if we hadn't have started relying on that um, as much but i also think at the end of the day we're keen to just get back in front of each other um, because, yeah, you don't, you just being able to sit in front of um, a set of plans or look on a screen and be able to talk like normal people does make a big difference. Mm. So I, I don't want to pretend that we're going to somehow work differently or not value the studio in the way we do, because I think yeah. we really value it. Yeah. But uh, it will give us more flexibility. So people who are parents, for example, who want to be able to work from home for half a day, that's much easier. Hmm. Yeah. Excellent. Claire, it's been great to connect with you and hear um, both about what you've been doing recently, but also to track back through um, earlier work and um, the things that interest you, as you put it, which I think is a, is a lovely way of putting it. So um, thanks very much for your um, generous presentation today. Um, and we look forward to seeing you in Brisbane um, in the near, very near future um, with, uh, with borders opening. Um, we'll have um, a couple more of these presentations this year um, as part of this series. And our next one will be from John Elway. Um, John was recently the recipient of the Houses Awards 
Australian House of the Year. So it'll be great to catch up with him um, and look at his um, recent body of work. So thanks again to everyone online for joining us today. And um, thanks again to Claire for sharing your experiences. Thanks, thanks Claire. Cameron. Thanks, everyone.